morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the organization, especially Kamash, to invite me. It's uh, quite an honor to uh, represent Free Clinic here to tell you something about our harm reduction uh, strategy. I also uh, would like to thank the translators because they do a, a great job to telling you what I'm uh, trying to tell you. So Free Clinic is uh, quite a big organization with 10 divisions. I give you uh, an introduction slide about Belgium. Maybe you should know something about that also. We have uh, about the same amount of residents as Hungary, but we are three times as small as Hungary. So it's a little bit tiny and cozy. We have three languages, we have three governments, we have six parliaments and prime ministers. So we have 42 ministers and um, seven state secretaries. That means that if you're looking for a job, it's better to look for a job in politics than in social work because you have more chance to get a job in politics. We have a little more than 400,000 people unemployed and if we look to the age group of minus 25, it's about 31% who is uh, not working at, at this time. The uh, livability in uh, Belgium is very mediocre in uh, Europe, it's right in the half. It's on the 21st place of 41 countries accounted for. Uh, we are part of the Flemish-speaking part, it's the north side of Belgium and Antwerp is quite in the middle. It's uh, the second biggest city of Flanders. Maybe I would tell you something about our uh, migrant status. We have about 11% migrants and if you look um, more in detail to that group of migrants, the top three are French people, Italian people and people from Holland. Also an introduction uh, slide about Antwerp. Here it's uh, the, the slogan of the city and it says that the city is from everyone. It's not really true. If you got the money, the city is yours. If you don't have the money, pity for you. So it's quite the uh, economic engine of uh, the Flanders region because of the big port, because uh, the World Diamond Center is also located over there. We have about uh, 164 nationalities in Antwerp and since uh, 2013 we have a new governance. Uh, it's, uh, we have to adjust to that, let's uh, say it positive. We have uh, nine districts in Antwerp, a little bit more than half a million, million residents and in the city district it's almost 100,000. Uh, because it's Belgium I also would tell you something uh, about chocolates and beer I think. So uh, the chocolate you see here, it's, uh, we call it Antwerp Hands. It has to do with the legend of Antwerp. Uh, before the ships were entering the harbor, they had to pay taxes. It was a big giant who was called Brabo. He guarded it. And if you did not pay the tax, he cut off your hands and he threw it into the river. And if you translate Antwerp, it means throwing hands. So that's about Antwerp. And then uh, what about beer? Uh, you always say about people of Antwerp, they have big mouths, they know everything better, they are very chauvinistic. And they say they have to because the, they drink their special beer in big glasses with a uh, with big hole, so they need to, get, uh, to have a big mouth. The drug use is comparable to other cities, also comparable uh, with this city here. Um, we also have concentration spots and reasons. Um, everybody says there has, we have to do something about it, but please not in my backyard. I think it's the same for District 8 here in Budapest, so I'm very familiar with you. We don't have much uh, exact numbers because uh, we, don't, we have a bad reputation about um, research things in Belgium. We have several hidden groups, but uh, I've already mentioned them. And we have a very old school drug scene. Um, the heroin is still the main drug in, uh, in Antwerp and it's followed by cocaine and why? Because the prices are low, we have good quality and the availability is very high because we have big seaport. Um, we have some uh, use in uh, public and semi-public settings so we are also in need of um, user rooms. And there is a huge underestimation of homelessness particularly for youngsters because they keep uh, falling off the radar because they are doing some couch surfing one week there, one week over there, one week over there, so you don't have really have to figure with that. This is the city line, here you have the, the cathedral, here you have the Boere Toren, uh, it's called Farmer Tower, it was the first skyscraper in uh, Europe, 
was built between the 1920s and 1930s. And maybe I should also mention this building here. It's uh, the police building. It's, uh, there are a lot of urban legends about it, good stories and bad stories. And we call it Gotham City, like in Batman. Uh, this is Free Clinic. Uh, we are now in an old railroad uh, building. We were pushed out of the city center to the north of Antwerp. We were gentrificated out of it. So um, we have the metro with us. We have two highways uh, in our backyard, and we have uh, a tra a ra uh, train rails in our backyard, so there's a lot of noise over there. I'm not going to bore you with all th those things, but uh, maybe I should mention two dates. It's uh, 1973. Uh, that year, uh, Free Clinic and I have in common because we first saw the first light in our lives in that year. So we are exactly uh, the same age. And in 1997, we were uh, recognized as a um, as, um, center for uh, rehabilitation of people who use drugs. We work with four pillars, cure and care, street corner work, selective and indicated prevention, and then social activation. I'll tell you something more about that. So our main core of free clinic is uh, the, uh, the biggest uh, division. It's called uh, MSOC, and if you translate it, it would be Medical Social Relief Center. We have the objective that almost every uh, harm reduction uh, NGO has, I we also use the definition for health like the WHO and we try to improve their quality of life. And we try to improve uh, quality of life on micro, basal and macro level, but you will hear more about it in the rest. Also, uh, Tamash already mentioned the, the standards. We use the standards of the MCDA, NIDA and, and other uh, organizations. And we think it's very important to combinate the actions. Uh, if you're only doing one action or two action, you do it separately, you won't make such good results. So the combination of actions, ma what makes the strategy, results in better outcomes, and it gives you synergy. So by uh, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, they say these are the fields of life where you have to do something about for people who use drugs. So there's a lot of different domains in their lives we have to take care of, or we try to take care. And if you look for the free clinic situation, all the green spots are covered by our, our organization. Um, from 1st of January, we will also cover the housing part because we uh, will cooperate in a, in a housing NGO for uh, people who use drugs. And as uh, in opposite with the Hungarian situation, we don't have legal advice, and it's a big problem. Okay, so in the, the main core, in uh, the, the biggest center of uh, our NGO, in the Medical Social Relief Center, we see about 750 people a year. Uh, we see the most of them in the, in the main core. And we have also a um, gender-specific center where we see about 40 women a week. We have a youngster uh, division uh, where we see uh, about 15 youngsters every week. And uh, we have also a, a profile-specific center at the same location as the youth center. So, so we try to see about a uh, little more than 350 people each week. If you have a very uh, big organization, you need a boss. That's our boss, it's the director. You see he's pointing 10 fingers because we have 10 divisions. So this is a listing up of the 10 divisions. Uh, we can uh, not keep up making our official document because the things always change, something like that. Okay, for those 10 divisions, we have uh, 56 people working at our NGO. And if you look to the Medical Social Relief Center, we have uh, quite a bunch of superwomen and supermen who work over there. Uh, I read it from top down, uh, from top to down for you. So above we have the, uh, the medical staff, we have doctors, we have a psychiatrist. We have uh, seven nurses, we have uh, social workers, um, outreach workers, psychologists, receptionists, 
keine Zielkoordinate haben. So I will try to, uh, to uh, use a multidisciplinary approach. So for, uh, for the intake, for the first interview that people want, if they want to come in our program, they uh, can uh, come every day between 10 and 12 o'clock. They don't need an appointment. And uh, the latest start will be in three working days. And this has to do with legal issues, because when we have to, when we want to uh, put someone in uh, opiate substitute therapy, we need uh, a positive urine test on opiates, and it has to be done by um, by an officially recognized laboratory, and that takes time. So because otherwise they could start faster, but it's because of legal issues. Then we have the different disciplines. So they can come for uh, medical care, so they come can see the doctor. It's not only their uh, addiction doctor, but it's also their general uh, practitioner. Because most of our clients, they don't have a general practitioner anymore, or they don't have the money to pay for it. We also can have psychiatric uh, consults by our psychiatrists. And then we come to the nurses. I am a nurse, by the way. Uh, we uh, do opiate substitute therapy with methadone and suboxone. We also deal a lot of um, psychopharmaca medication for people with mental problems and also the medication for somatic needs, especially for people with chronic diseases, some, sometimes also for acute things. So the point is over there, we see everyone three till six times a week. So we know what's going, uh, what's going on with them. So we can uh, encourage them in their daily living and uh, to encourage them for uh, steps they have to take in hopefully a positive direction. We have social service. Um, maybe I should tell you so something else about Belgium. It's quite a paper country. You uh, need uh, 100 papers if you, would, if you want to get anything done by um, governmental organizations. And if you finally made it to have the 100 documents, then they change it. So we have a lot of work with that. It's uh, <laughs> almost the, the core business of our social service. We can come for nursing care also. We do a lot of wound care and uh, a lot of uh, screening also to uh, blood transmitted infections and sexual transmitted infections. And now the last two years, we try to improve access to the regular service providers because we don't think you always have to need special service for people who use drugs, but we want to lower the threshold for our clients. And now the last two years, we are doing a lot of things around dentists because a lot of our clients, they're having really dental graveyards. They neglected their teeth for years and years. And they're so ashamed to go to the dentist and to open their mouth over there so they, they don't do it. But now we have a cooperation with some dentists and uh, they're used to see these things. And we, uh, for the first time, we always uh, accompany them. So that's uh, what we're doing now the last two years. We also have an exchange service, but it's not really part of the needle exchange program. It's uh, really a part of our uh, of our relief center. Um, it's done by all the team members, and we try to uh, connect with people who are not um, do not take part of, of our all our different um, disciplines. So it's about thirty people daily who are not really in, uh, in our program, but they come for the exchange. We have a gender-specific service, I already mentioned uh, before, and it's uh, uh, on a separate location, uh, women's only. Um, uh, the clients are women, uh, the workers are women, and the doctors are women too. We have uh, actually uh, some outreach workers also, but we also choose to do uh, our outreach work with our uh, clients, with our individual clients. We do it ourselves. So also nurses, also social workers do uh, outreach work with their individual clients. And it also has to do a lot with the 100 paper story I told you before. When necessary, they can have uh, individual drug uh, counseling. They can ask them themselves. So it's, uh, it's uh, a kind of on-demand service. 
but it also can be on indication. If uh, some uh, of the staff see that uh, a guy is uh, having a lot of problems with, with some special uh, topic, then we try to fix it. Then you get uh, your contacts with a fixed social worker. Uh, it's not like in the social service in the morning, uh, you uh, can have an, a fixed social worker who will, um, who knows your file and things like that. You also can get uh, psychotherapeutic, psychotherapeutic counseling by the psychologist. We also, again, in the story of the 100 papers, we need a lot of diagnostics. So the psychologists also do this. Now, a lot of our clients have uh, multiple problems. They have uh, problems on different domains of life. And uh, sometimes it's too much for one person to handle this. Then we have uh, a kind of mini team and we, uh, we look at the problems, we see uh, what possibilities we have and we also see which worker who is specialized in different topics. So we uh, try to get the best man for the job or best woman, of course, because it's mostly women. So this is the general picture of the, uh, the big corn of three clinic. We also have uh, needle exchange uh, programs in uh, the Flanders region. Our free clinic manages the um, needle exchange points for uh, the Antwerp region, but also for the whole Flanders region. So I also will give you some figures f about uh, the two regions. So the Antwerp region and the Flanders region, which is five times bigger than the Antwerp re region. So maybe I would tell you something about uh, distribution and recuperation. Um, in 2014, we distributed about um, six, a little more than 600,000 syringes, and we even uh, recuperated more than we distributed. So it, it means that our users also get their, um, their equipment by the pharmacy and, and other uh, contact points, and they also actually deliver it in at our services. We are very happy about that. So also if we look for the, the Antwerp figures here, we have a recuperation rate of 106%. Um, yeah, I should not elaborate on that, I think. So we do an annual questionnaire also in our uh, needle exchange program for the whole Flanders region. We also do it in Antwerp. And about 20% of the visitors, they do not have contact with service providers for drug care. So it's an important drug point, but Tamaj already told you also. And it's also a, an important prevention strategy for um, hepatitis C. Because uh, one on two hepatitis C infections are, are there uh, within the first year of onset in the intravenous, intravenous use. And the average age of the first injection is uh, mostly under 20, so we have to find young people who use, who inject drugs also. And we can do that by their needle exchange programs. So if you see for the Flanders region, for you it's on the left-hand side, yes. Uh, for the Flanders region, about 25% uh, never enrolled in a program or is not enrolled in a program in that uh, time. And for Antwerp, it's even 37%. So 37% of the people who visit the needle exchange program are not enrolled in a treatment program. So the needle exchange program, they reach as hard to, uh, hard to reach uh, users. But uh, maybe we also uh, should uh, make the question for ourselves, or are we a service provider maybe hard to reach? Also something to think about. Bubbles and Bubbles is a service for uh, parenting support uh, for uh, parents who use and they have children. They do extensive case management and they try to uh, improve, the, um, uh, improve the skills of uh, other NGOs who work with our clients. Then we have our youngster service. Uh, I elaborate a little bit more on that because I work also there. So it's harm reduction and risk reduction for uh, youngsters. We also like to say risk reduction because um, uh, it's better for policymakers. They like more risk reduction than harm reduction. So 
maybe we should talk the talk. So, and are these youngsters really in need for harm reduction? Yes, they are, um, because we see that in different things. Uh, so, they are in the need status. It's a new European buzzword. If you want to write projects for uh, Europe with youngsters, use the word need. It's important for them. So, the need status means that they're not in education, employment, or training. And if you are six months in that need status, at the age of 21, it induces you up to four times more risk for unemployment, which is a lot. Three times more risk for depression and psycholo psychological problems, which also is not good. And five times more risk for a criminal record. And six times less chance to obtain a diploma. And that it's really a problem in our society. If you don't have the diploma, if you have a criminal record, and if you're depressed, it will be unlikely that you find a job. So also important to keep them in education because um, besides their own families, schools are the second most important influences for their social development. They not only uh, miss their diploma, but they also miss, uh, they also lack a lot of skills they need in uh, the social life. So if we see, uh, if you look at our group of youngsters, we uh, met 122 youngsters. Half, uh, more than half of them had a file at the juvenile court. Uh, almost one in five was ever in prison and uh, more than one in four was ever in youth detention. If we look to the, to the statistics a little bit more in detail, uh, 10 of the, our youngsters who served together 88 months in prison that's first, it's a lot of time. And uh, otherwise, it's also uh, a very expensive thing for society. Because one day in jail costs 170 euros a day in Belgium. Now it's more, but it's, uh, it's a well kept secret, so they don't uh, release the, the actual figure. But uh, that's the one we found it in uh, a parliamentary question in 2011, so we use this amount. But if you um, multiply it with the 88 months, it was. 449,000 euros of public spending, which is a lot of money. We can do a lot of with that money. So we think we have to be there for those youngsters uh, in every, um, every phase of their life and any steps towards uh, the greatest risks are step in a good direction. But even if they go up the stairs again, we have to be there. Because probably you can uh, change the direction. So on the 2nd September of this year, we um, were quite shocked in Belgium. It was also the first day of the Yoda workshop in Antwerp, so we remember the day very well. Because on that day, Jodi died. And uh, Jordi, he was a 19-year-old guy. He was uh, kicked out of um, uh, juvenile protection because he was over 18. He uh, ended up on the streets and uh, he could not apply for help uh, for the adult okay. services because uh, they say he was too young. So he stayed outside, yeah, he uh, was homeless. He slept in a tent in a public park in Ghent, it's the third biggest city of uh, Belgium. And he died uh, there from starvation. So it is really pity. Now there was a lot of uh, media attention for that, and it's also good that there was a lot of media at attention for it. Because um, and uh, nobody in the media or, or in the, the public opinion wants to um, to get your buried uh, very anonym. So they did a Facebook group. They uh, raised funds to uh, give him a proper burial and things like that. So it was between brackets good for Jordi. But also in our service, we had uh, some people who died over there on a very young age. And they died anonymous with no media attention. So that's why we need also youngster services with a harm reduction philosophy. We do street corner work, or, uh, street corner work with uh, prostitutes, but I won't elaborate on that. We have an activation team. They do. Uh, they try to do things with uh, hardcore um, users on on squares and hotspots in the in the city. They try not to animate them, but to activate them. So they try to make a difference, to do positive things for the neighborhoods. Yeah. 
Yes, it does. Uh, they try to reconnect them with uh, neighborhoods and improve their well-being. The well-being from the from the persons who use drugs, but also the well-being of the the hotspots in the neighborhood. They also have a division that they call uh, Bureau Active, and Bureau Active um, does also the activation of the hardcore users. But they um, have a starting point. They have work. So those who cannot um, fit in in economic uh, work environments, uh, we try to give them something to do in the day. The picture you see, it's a picture at uh, our Antwerp Harbor. Uh, that's the place where all the work in the harbor is uh, distributed. So you see on top there, you see the people who have the work, they uh, spread out the papers and then uh, every worker who has a paper can go to that boat or to that thing in the harbor. We use the same methodology, so we also have something like that. Our building is not that big, of course. And um, we offer them then a volunteer's contract and uh, compensation, and the compensation is eight euros a day and a sandwich. So they can do then uh, a job for a part of the day, and it's very different. So every day we have between uh, five and 15 jobs, something like that. And everyone who wants to, to do it can join it. And now they will get their own building because, um, and the, the building is called the Nomad. Uh, if you translate it, it's Nomad. It, uh, it's because they were already looking for 12 years for a building and they did not get one. But now we have one uh, in, um, in cooperation with private sponsors and they, uh, it's just bes uh, behind Free Clinic beside the railroad. So, but they will have, at least at, at the end, they will have their own building. We also do syringe patrol. They clean up stray syringes. Uh, they're relatively few in, uh, in Antwerp. So I think the total amount of 5,000, that's not so much. If you, s if you know, we uh, distribute more than 100,000 syringes. So that's quite okay. So it's a professional worker and some volunteers who do it. They clean up on uh, public domain and also on location on demand. You also see the fatters. Uh, I cannot really um, translate it, but that means it's uh, a fixed person uh, of contact. So there are persons who live in a neighborhood and uh, they are the contact person for the whole neighborhood. If something is about uh, stray syringes or paraphernalia they found over there for the cleaning up. He does the cleaning up or he does um, just call the, the professional guy from Syringe Patrol and then the next time we, they include it in their, uh, in their tour. So, but those uh, contact persons can be users, they can be ex-users, but they also can be uh, residents of, of a neighborhood. And it's good to have the mix of them. Okay, sometimes we have to think out of the box. I think we also have to do it uh, within uh, harm reduction strategies. This one, I won't elaborate much on it because um, it's not the topic of uh, this presentation, but we have a lot of problems mm -hmm. with uh, people who use drugs who get older because they live faster than their calendar years. So they're 50 or 55 years old, but they have a body and they have organs of a 75-year-old uh, person. They need specific cares and needs, and we cannot offer them. Not, uh, not as free clinic, but not even a society. Because there are some regulations that say you have to be 65 to get those care and those needs. So um, that's a problem. So thinking out of the box, maybe also in the box, where uh, we need drug consumption rules, that's for sure. Uh, maybe for... Uh, multiple reasons. We also have serious gaps in our uh, needle exchange program coverage in the Flanders region, um, especially in, in this part of the country. There is really a, a very big gap. So a lot of people are traveling train or bus with uh, gym bags full of uh, dirty syringes. If they get caught by the police there, then they get also convicted for drug using. So it's not, uh, it's not a good thing for them. 
that's not uh, not the only problem. Um, okay, they cannot get rid of the used syringes, but they also cannot get their new syringes. That's a little bit the problem. They have to travel quite some kilometers to uh, to come to the nearest needle exchange programs. So for that, we maybe need to uh, look for other solutions. I have some uh, examples from Australia and from uh, this one is from Marseille in France. So uh, they have uh, for for uh, spots where they don't have a needle uh, exchange program, they have drop boxes and they have distributing or vending machines. So maybe it's something to think about in our Belgium context, but we have also have some legal issues about that. Because we uh, we have also have the drop boxes, but our local government does not support it. They are against it. So we only can work with private partners who wants to have it on their private property. But that's what we are doing now. So we have uh, some drop boxes on private private properties. So on this one, I won't elaborate either because it will be uh, the subject of another presentation. But I would uh, like to make the translation to a Belgium. Uh, if it was in Belgium, it would be like this. So if I see the figures uh, for 2015, so on uh, approximately 10,000 people who use drugs, uh, gets 6% uh, of them gets HCV positive. That means 600 new HC HCVs. If you multiply it by the amount for the treatment, it gives you 42 million euros. What is a lot of money? And it's uh, it's just for the treatment. It's not uh, not accounted for the social costs or the the loss of healthy years. So and that's only for the Budapest area. So with this money that um, the Budapest area will have to spend in later years, we would do 49 years of more extended needle exchange program for the whole Flanders area. So cutting down in needle exchange programs, not a good strategy. It will cost you a lot of money. Also about HCV, um, we had a uh, uh, hepatologist specialist who wants to treat people who use drugs. We have free clinic, of course, who wants to get them in treatment. And we had a needle exchange program who, uh, who could find the people. So that was OK. But still, there was uh, something missing. We uh, missed uh, still a connection to get those people on the right places on the right time, because sometimes that's the problem. And now we had uh, a project called uh, Sea Buddies, and uh, pharma, uh, the pharma pharmacological companies paid for that, uh, because they earn a lot of money about HCV uh, treatments. So those uh, hepatitis C buddies, they um, they help people in treatments to get on uh, the right time, the right day, the right hospital, things like that. And they try to uh, cover a lot of issues where these clients are uh, bothering with. That was the detail. Okay, and also we have a substantial decline of hepatitis C virus transmission because we have uh, a really comprehensive approach. We have uh, two regions of the five in Flanders who use this comprehensive uh, approach. And we see both, even for the Antwerp region and for the Limburg region, they actually go down on uh, H uh, HCV positive people. So in the end, it does work. So harm reduction has quite a negative perception, but uh, Tomas already uh, told you uh, about this and we should reframe it. And we, we should reframing it and we should reframe it every time again and again and again and again. We have to repeat it. So police, um, yeah, they're a big part of our city. We have police in Vienna. We also have the militaries now, so we have a lot of them. Sure, there has to be uh, supply and demand reduction, but it should be balanced, I think. Now, some good practices of cooperation with our local police that we are working now, and we really like to finish it in uh, the spring of 2017. We are working now on um, a charter between um, of, of respectful, um, of being respectful f to police 
from people who use drugs and vice versa. So uh, we try to make this, this charter that uh, we treat each other with respect and we don't, and that, that they don't take their clean syringes, that they don't take away their methadone and things like that. And on the other part, the people who use drugs, they will inform the police if they have uh, syringes in their pockets so the police won't uh, stick themselves if they're searching them, things like that. We also have a cooperation with the Justice Department. If someone wants to enroll in a program of a free clinic, then they uh, can, um, we can um, ask the Justice Department uh, what things are going on for this specific client. If we know he has to go within three months in jail, it's not a good idea to look for a new apartment for him because then he, he go end up with a lot of debts. So, and that's for that situation, we can ask the Justice Department what it's hanging on, what's the legal status of this person. Does he have to go to jail? Does he have to go to court? Um, things like that. Maybe we should uh, also do some downscaling. If you get big projects and big NGOs, um, it always gets a problem with the neighborhood. If you do littler projects, you, you blend into to, uh, society. We see that with our, um, with our um, project for women and uh, project for youngsters. They are just little houses. They're just passing about 20 to 40 people a day, so it's not that big deal. The streets, or people in the street and, and, and uh, the neighborhoods, they don't even know where we are there. So baby downscaling is not a bad thing. And also you will have more access points. I think also part of harm reduction is, uh, is a dialogue with your clients. You're working uh, for them, with them, and so you also have to hear them, not only talk about them, you have to talk with them. So we do that now since 2006. Uh, every division is represented in this council. Um, it's with ups and downs. It uh, takes a lot of effort, but I think we should do this. Okay. This was the last one. I hope I'm within the time. <laughs>